Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mike Willett from Ceres at Iowa State University. And uh, we have our three-step process that we use with clients, and that's engage, educate, and embed. And uh, the engage part is that we try to find out uh, what is specifically what your issues are. And uh, that's probably why you were invited to attend this seminar, because uh, you were hand-selected by our account managers or myself. And uh, the second, educate, is what we're going to be doing today. And then embed is uh, what we'll try to do uh, toward the end of this uh, seminar is to really get into your company and find out the specific details and find out exactly what it is that, that you need and help you to follow through to get results. Uh, today our speaker is Dr. Lisa Lang. And uh, I first met her in 2007. Uh, most, of, most of you guys, uh, online here I probably worked with, but if not, I look forward to doing that with you. Um, the theory of constraints has been around for a long time, and uh, the, the father of, of TOC is uh, Ellie Goldratt, and Lisa has personally worked with her, or with him, and uh, she is probably one of the foremost experts in the world on uh, TOC and specifically in the in its relationship to job shop operations. Uh, in fact, she uh, has owned a job shop for 12 years herself. She's worked with over 180 uh, job shops to reduce their lead time and improve their due date. She's the former director of the International TOC uh, Board. And this is the second broadcast. Uh, we did this broadcast last year. We had uh, four companies sign up for the course, and those four companies uh, reported over one and a half million dollars of impact uh, from taking the course and doing the things that uh, Lisa will be outlining today. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lisa Lang, Dr. Lisa Lang. We'll take uh, questions at any time. You can type them in the dialog box, uh, or we'll have... Uh, open mic at the end of the session. So, Dr. Lucia. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm excited to be here with everybody today, and I also want to thank Cirrus for hosting this. So, what I'm going to do over the next 60 minutes is take you through the unique process I've used to help hundreds of shops get more jobs done faster. And by the time we're done here today, you'll know exactly what it takes to accelerate jobs through your shop. And as Mike said, feel free to ask questions at any time. I'm probably not going to take them till the end just to have continuity of flow. And some of your questions will likely be answered as, uh, as we're going through here. So I'd like to start by having you imagine. Uh, I'd like for you to take a quick moment and just imagine that it's tomorrow morning and you get out of your car, you walk through your building, uh, through the shop, and discover magically that your productivity has increased by 64%. Now think about that for a moment and really picture it. You're getting more done than you've ever been able to accomplish. You're meeting and offer, often exceeding your customers' expectations. The shop is no longer the one who gets blamed for all the manufacturing missed due dates and issues. So just imagine that. In addition, imagine if um, your customers started to be really impressed with what you're doing, that you had a reduction in chaos, you have an improvement in delivery times, reduced re rework. Imagine that your due date performance goes from 69% to 96% with fewer people. You've even lost some people in the process. Or imagine that you have improved your on-time delivery, you've reduced the lead times, and you're achieving record profits. Imagine that you're getting 10 times more jobs done with the same people and resources and that you're 100% on time. Well, we're going to stop talking about what others have achieved and talk about how I've made it happen and how you can too. And at the end, I'm going to reveal exactly what you can do tomorrow, yes, tomorrow, to start improving your results. So let's go ahead and jump in. There are four uh, specific things you must know so you can get your shop to the next level and rapidly improve your revenues. First, it's critically important to recognize that scheduling is one of the most vital areas of your business. 
the truly successful companies have conquered the schedule the challenges of scheduling and once you really understand the secret of scheduling you'll be amazed at how much you can get done and how quickly you can do it so I'm going to cover the challenges to scheduling a highly custom job shop and the mistakes most shops make when trying to schedule if you don't understand why what you're doing is currently not working it's really difficult to improve so we'll start with some background about understanding why scheduling is so difficult second I'm going to reveal the solution the whole system nothing held back so that you're clear on what it takes to reduce your lead times and get more done third we need to work together to assure that the solution is perfect fit for you that it will work consistently and effectively and that the results come quickly custom job shops by nature are very complex and very different every single client I've worked with had a series of factors that came together to form a unique set of needs and the secret is to discover what would make the difference for your unique shop and fourth it's time for you to take action I'm going to get very specific on the first step so that you can get started tomorrow you need to be able to apply it to your shop tomorrow so your next question will be well okay so how do we do all of this and that's a good question that's the question I first started asking myself when I was in graduate school this is when I uh, I worked for Clorox at the time at a Kingsford charcoal plant and I discovered this little book called the goal that really changed my life I read it I loved it it was so logical it it was common sense and the engineer and me just immediately uh, connected with the material and you probably remember the story in the book about the uh, Boy, Boy Scout hike with Herbie and Herbie was kind of the slowest hiker uh, he was a little bit overweight so he went slow and he had a really heavy backpack and the story went on to show how Herbie was the constraint and what the Boy Scouts did to uh, have him lead so he set the pace for all the hikers as well as how they uh, offloaded some of the stuff that was in his backpack so that in total they could cover more ground together and as soon as I read this book and the story I knew this was the answer to productivity problems and I vowed to devote my career to finding this unique set of solutions that would solve those problems and I did and it all boils down to one critical fact and that is that our output is dictated by our constraint period and you know that that was the moral of that story what is blocking your success what are the unique, the unique factors in your business that if we fixed removed altered or somehow adjusted them would allow you to take your company right to the top this is the critical question that shortcuts everything the answer can be the difference between inevitable failure and extraordinary success so how do we go about finding your constraint well the answer is that the secret is in scheduling in fact I surveyed 1500 business owners and worked with well over now 230 custom job shops and I consistently find that the single most powerful point of intervention is scheduling when you tackle the scheduling monster you've got it nailed so let's take a look at what makes scheduling such a difficult monster for your business and some of you may have taken a look at my nine challenges ebook and I'm going to briefly cover some of those scheduling challenges in there because the fact is scheduling is hard and with good reason I know you're familiar with it uh, first clients customers change their mind a lot <laughs> they move their orders back they move them up or some of both and of course as soon as they do that the schedule needs to be redone I was working with one client who had Caterpillar as a customer and it was they had this huge order and it was urgent and they had all hands on deck working on this Caterpillar order about a month into it Caterpillar calls and says uh, we need to push that back six months I mean I'm sure you have stories like that as well uh, vendors raw material vendors and outside process vendors they don't always del deliver to us when promised and if they're off of course that can throw us off and then of course our mix can vary wildly and this is even more dramatic the more custom you are so one week you can have a constraint in turning and the next week you might be more heavily laden at, at the mills or at grinding or someplace totally different so you can also have the situation where you have a bunch of emergencies one week and then the next week you really don't have very many and then these mix changes of course cause your constraint to move so what I find in these uh, job shop environments is that the constraint can move day to day uh, week to week at least but sometimes even day to day 
Another challenge can be the capabilities of your employees. Very few shops are blessed with complete cross training, but even if you have a fair amount of cross training, uh, that doesn't mean that your employees will show up or show up on time. In addition, our processes can be unreliable. This is even more true if you're constantly running new parts, parts you haven't run before, and of course that happens a lot in job shops. But even on repeat jobs, things can change or the job requires a particular machine due to the size of the part or to the precision needed, making scheduling that much harder. Uh, have you ever had a customer change the spec on you and not tell you for some reason? Uh, that certainly would fall into this category as well. But people aren't uh, the only resource that can let you down. The fact is machines break down and it seems to be at the worst possible moment creating a scheduling nightmare and confirming that, unfortunately, Murphy is alive and well and likely toasting to us. And we all know that no matter how good our intentions, quality isn't perfect. So no matter how good your quality, anything that's less than perfect impacts the schedule and has a ripple effect. And then add to that that our data is not readily available or accurate, makes it difficult to improve the situation. Uh, job time estimates are just that, they're estimates. I have a saying that the only thing we know for sure about our estimates is that they're wrong. You know, the question is how much and in which direction. And finally, communication between silos is often difficult. Orders are thrown over the wall and the relationship between sales and manufacturing can suffer for it. So typically what we do is we create the schedule and then we update the schedule and we get stuck in this perpetual loop of rescheduling due to all these sources of variability that we encounter. And these problems make it difficult, if not impossible, for you to be 100% on time all the time. And they, of course, lengthen your lead time and increase the chaos. So we manufacturers typically try to improve and, and deal with the challenges by adding more detail to our schedule. So you can see the little cartoon I've added here. Uh, that's a lot of detail. But that's how we traditionally try to solve the problem. We just add a lot more detail. We schedule every job on every machine. And while that sounds like a good solution, in fact, it's the worst thing you can do. The simple truth is that contrary to popular belief, those sources of variability do not go away or even reduce when you add detail. Having more detail scheduled just means we're, we're more wrong. And as we encounter the variability, we spend our days updating the schedule and updating the schedule. So this sounds kind of crazy. So, you know, why do we do this? Well, there is some logic behind it, so it's not that we're all uh, doing the wrong things. Actually, everybody does this, and it's pretty logical as to why we do it. So I'm going to explain some of that logic to you. Why do so many factors continue to use old school methods? Um, well, we can answer that question by asking another. What's one of the key measures you use to make sure you're going to make money and optimize ROI? So if I, had, if I just said, what, what's a key measure for you? A common answer is efficiency. So efficiency has always been the gold standard, but it's totally wrong. It is in the name of efficiency that we do what we do and we experience the frustration and chaos of trying to run our shops. So let me explain. Let's say that we have a fairly simple shop. We've got a shop that has, let's say, five steps. And I know some of you have... Um, three steps and some of you might have 15 steps or something in between. But I'm just going to keep it simple for this example. We're just going to have a shop that has five steps. Now, these five steps could be five departments. So think of it as you know five steps in the routing or five departments, something like that. Now let's talk about what it means that we're all driven by efficiency. And I think this is driven into us at a very young age, this efficiency mentality. So let's say that I have these five steps and I want to be efficient. So what do I do if I want to be efficient? Well, I make sure that the capacity I have at each of these steps is about the same for the mix of work I typically do. So that mix of work in a job shop is, you know, it does vary a lot, but usually you have a kind of something representative or typical. So whatever the typical stuff I do, I'm going to make sure that I have the capacity at each step for that. So if I want to make 20 custom whatever I make per day, and if I want to be efficient, then I need to make sure that each area, each step in my routing will have the capacity to do 20 per day. Now this is called balance capacity and it's balanced meaning no one or department has any more capacity than anybody else. So for the most part we can usually 
add capacity and keep it fairly balanced. The exception I find a lot is with the saw. Usually the saw has a lot more capacity than everything else. But generally, we the mindset is that we're trying to balance capacity. Okay, so they all have the capacity to do on average 20 per day. So 20 custom collets or 20 custom dies or what, whatever it is that you make. So now let's talk about what can go wrong with this because this so far sounds actually pretty good. If each step has the, ab the ability, the capacity to do 20 per day, then that 20 is an average. So if I drew that as a distribution and I say 20 is the average, then I can calculate the probability that I'm going to get 20 or more out out of any one of these steps. If I look at one step in isolation, and we'll look at step A here, I can easily calculate the probability of getting 20 or more out of that step. That's sim simply the area under the curve here. So there's a 50% probability that I will produce 20 or more at any one step. But sometimes I will produce on the low end and I'll get out only 17. And sometimes I will produce more than 20 and I might get out as many as 23. There is a 50% chance of getting 20 or more out of any one step in isolation. And assuming the same variability at each step, and I have five steps here, and I have interdependency between these five steps, meaning in most of your routings, you can't start with step C or any department with available capacity. You have to do your manufacturing steps in order. That's interdependency. Now, depending on how many steps you have, I have five, I'm going to put that probability of getting 20 or more at any one step, 0.5, to the fifth. And if you had 10 steps, it would be to the tenth. In this case, we have the probability of getting 20 or more out of this system, perfectly designed to do 20, by the way, at, at actually only 3.13%. So I may have thought I was going to get out 20. I may have designed the system to get out 20. That's the theoretical capacity. But in reality, it's going to be very, very difficult to produce 20. And the reason is, whatever comes out of step A, let's say we get 18 done in this first step, and we pass 18 to, on to, to the second step, step B, Yes, it does have the capacity to do 20, but it also has variability. So let's say the variability of each step is plus or minus 3, like we discussed for step A. So step, the second step got past 18. It has variability of plus or minus 3. Now, it cannot get done plus 3 because it only got past 18, but it can be minus. And whatever gets done gets passed to the third step. It also has variability. It can produce whatever it gets pass, plus or minus three, and so on. And it can't be plus. You can't produce more than it was passed, but it can always be minus. So you see, it's very unlikely that we're going to produce 20, only about 3% chance. Hey, Mike, can you go ahead and mute your line? We're hearing a little bit of background noise. Okay. All right, so if we're not likely to get 20 out, then the next question is, well, um, how many are we going to get out? I'm still hearing you, Mike. I'll go ahead and mute you on this. Okay. Sorry about that. So if we're not going to get 20 out, what? how many are we going to get out? That's really the question. I didn't know what the answer was, but in Excel there's something called a Monte Carlo simulation that you can do. And I put this scenario in that simulation. I assumed we had five steps that the average of each step was 20 plus or minus 3, and I ran the simulation a thousand times. And what that did is give me a thousand outputs. Then I graphed the outputs to create a distribution. So here's the distribution. And sure enough, 3% of the time, which was way to the right of the graph, I would get 20 or more out. So it was possible to get 20 or more out, it just wasn't highly probable. But the average was far less than the 20 that we desired. It was actually nine point something, and I just found that so depressing, I, I rounded up to 10. So here we have a tip, typically getting more like 10 out. So now we're getting 10 out in a system that, remember, was designed to do 20. The efficiency mentality causes us to balance capacity. 
So we don't want to waste capacity by having any resource have more than it needs. I mean, that, that makes sense, right? So why would we buy more capacity than what it needs? So we make sure that all resources have the capacity for whatever our typical production requirements are. In this case, it was 20 per day. That thinking would work if there was absolutely no variability, if you never had a bottleneck and Murphy never came to visit. So you may not know your theoretical capacity. Most people don't know these numbers here, and that's okay. Um, but if I asked you, are you producing to your full capacity that you suspect you have, the answer would probably be no. We don't need to know what your capacity at each step of your process is. The key takeaway from this is that if you're like most of us, you're intuitively balancing your capacity to reduce waste and increase efficiency, then any time you experience variability, any of those nine challenges that create the scheduling monster we talked about, it makes it really hard to get things done. Now, there is one more thing we do in the name of efficiency that is sabotaging us. We increase our work and process, our WIP. So let me explain that. Due to balanced capacity and the reality that variability does exist, sometimes we have resources with no work. Have you ever had an employee that had, uh, that had nothing to do and did it drive you absolutely crazy? I know it did for me. Did you find them something to do quickly? And then did you feel better once everybody was back to work again? I thought so because that's exactly what I used to do. The best way to ensure everyone and or every machine has something to do is to make all the orders you have in-house available to be worked on. And I'm saying all, but all or a very large portion. Your employees have different skills, different machines work at different rates, machines go down, etc. So if you want to be efficient and you want to keep your resources busy, the best way to do that is put all the work on the floor. With all the orders available to be worked on, you've increased the likelihood that everyone, no matter their skill, will have something to do, right? Makes sense. So, you know, what's so bad about that? It does sound efficient. Let's say your quoted lead time is six weeks for whatever you produce. And in job shops, usually we have quoted lead time. Some will have, you know, two week quoted lead time. Some will have four, some will have six, some will have 14. We have a range, but I'm just gonna use an example here. We might, maybe we have a weighted average of six weeks for whatever you do. It could be one week or 10, but we're gonna use six weeks here. Knowing your quoted lead time or the weighted average of your quoted lead time, what I can tell you if you are like most of the people I start working with is that if your quoted lead time is six weeks, then the amount of time of work and process you have in your system is about six weeks worth. Why? Because of efficiency. In other words, if I want to increase the likelihood of every resource, person, and or equipment, depending on your situation, has something to do, we can have the most efficient use of our resources. The way to do that is to make sure all the available work is out there for everyone to work on. So your work and process level is six weeks worth or whatever your typical uh, weighted average quoted lead time is. The key is that all of your work is on the floor and your whip is maxed out. There is a direct correlation between the amount of whip you have and how long it takes to get through the shop. You can also read about that in something called Little's Law. The more whip, the longer it takes. That's why when you're, you're busy, you quote a longer lead time than when you're not so busy. You probably have had that experience. So our efficiency focus is causing our jobs to take longer to get done. Efficiency is causing our jobs to take longer to get done. And because our quoted lead time is the same as the time it takes to get a job through the shop, if anything goes wrong, chaos increases and due date performance gets worse. Who would have thought that something that's supposed to be so good, efficiency, is actually having such a negative effect? Clearly, efficiency is not the answer. In fact, efficiency is part of the problem. It's actually slowing us down. We need to stop trying to be efficient, and instead focus on what we really want. We want to get more jobs done faster so that we can do more jobs with the same people and resources so that we can make more money and get the things we really want for our business. That was the point of the goal, right? What is the goal? The goal is to make more money. It is not to be efficient. So apart from great quality, the best way to get a steady stream of consistently satisfied customers is to get jobs done faster when promised and of course, once you do that, then you're going to start getting more customers. And that means increasing business, increasing revenues, and all the things you imagine when we started today's call. 
Here is what you must remember if you really want to improve your scheduling. Efficiency is not a prerequisite for improvement. It is an effect. So let me just repeat that. Efficiency is not a prerequisite for improvement. It is an effect. In order to become efficient, we have to stop doing the things typically associated with efficiency and start focusing on flow. That's what I call your velocity. And when you focus on flow, efficiency is a nice effect that occurs. So let's give a quick review. I began development of the Velocity Scheduling System in 2002 and have since used it with dramatic results in over 230 custom job shops. And if you want the same results, then here's what you need to do. Realize that the goal is to make money. It's not to keep everyone busy or to be efficient. The secret here is to become efficient at making money. So the first thing you'll do is shift your goals. In Velocity Scheduling System, you measure flow. You don't worry about or measure or track efficiencies. You, you aren't focused on tr tracking the time you spend on a job. What separates you from the pack is that you know that you don't need tracking to get more jobs done faster. You never detail schedule and you never add detail. You've learned that due to variability, more detail just means more wrong and more rescheduling. You have reduced WIP to about half of where it is now. You and your team always focus on finishing what you started rather than starting more stuff. And you use buffers to absorb and manage the variability that will be there for sure. You track the major disruptions to flow. As a velocity scheduling system expert, you always know that your major disruptions to flow are what they are, and you use information to direct your continuous improvement. You improve first your largest disruption to flow, then the second largest, and so on. You know that focus and flow are the name of the game, and you always get more jobs done faster. And finally, you always remember that a system is based on uniqueness. So you tweak it to fit precisely for you and your shop. So you can uh, picture where velocity scheduling will take you. Let's just take a closer look at some of the details. To compare the six-week lead time we were talking about before, and to compare and contrast the efficiency approach with this velocity or flow approach, I'm going to draw the five circles again and label the six weeks. So we have that to start. In the velocity scheduling system, the first thing we do is cut the work and process in half. And I'm saying in half, you know, some is more, some is less. It depends on your particular shop. But again, just bear with me using an example here. So instead of having six weeks worth of stuff and process, we're only going to have three. Now, this is a picture of a velocity board that we use for our visual scheduling system. We expect three weeks worth of jobs to be somewhere on the velocity board. Now, because I've cut the work and process in half, I really haven't improved anything yet. You know, I went from six weeks to three weeks, but sitting over here on the tube release board, waiting for its turn is the other three weeks worth of stuff. So I still have the six weeks. So far, I've gained nothing by cutting the work in process. I'm still showing six weeks in total, three in process and three waiting for its turn. Okay, so let me explain where the improvement comes in and how we get faster and faster. Well, first of all, by cutting the work in process, I have less stuff for my team to work on, and each job spends less time sitting and waiting. Because I have less stuff for my team to work on, and they know what their priorities are, we have one priority system. It's red, yellow, green. They know to work on red stuff first, assuming they have the skill to do it, then yellow, and then green. The priority system ensures that we work on the jobs that have been in process the longest. This velocity board is a big physical board, and the goal is to finish all jobs by the end of the yellow zone. So with a combination of less whip, which reduces queue time, a clear priority system, a goal to finish by the end of the yellow zone, we actually start to finish by the end of the yellow zone. Remember, there's less stuff out there, and so we can actually gain speed. And this happens you know, pretty fast. It's amazing what less whip and focusing on finishing uh, can really do. And as a result of finishing most jobs by the end of the yellow zone, this process no longer takes three weeks. It's two. And if this is two weeks, then of course, so is this. And very quickly, the jobs that were taking us four weeks to get done are now only taking four weeks. In addition to this improvement, we work on getting what I call full kit for the jobs that are waiting for their turn to be produced. While these jobs are waiting for their turn to be worked on, we make sure that we have everything we need. 
so that when we actually start the job, we can go from start to finish without disruption. We typically waste a lot of time looking for stuff. We look for parts, we look for raw materials, we look for tools, we look for programs, we look for the engineer, we look for the drawings, etc. Imagine if every time you started a job, you had everything you needed to get it finished. The effect of this improvement is that our velocity improves and jobs are now getting done faster, a little earlier than the end of the yellow zone. We size the velocity board so that you are only going into the red zone about 5% of the time. The reason we go into the red zone is typically due to one of our sources of variability, one of those nine challenges. But whatever the reason, it is a disruption to flow. It has slowed our velocity. And if we want more jobs to get done faster, we need to reduce or eliminate the biggest disruption to flow we have. So every time we go into the red zone, we find out why. Every time I go into the red zone, why, why, why? After a while, I have collected a nice list of reasons why. Then what I do is I Pareto those reasons. And, and Pareto is just a fancy way of saying how often did each reason occur. So for example, if we looked at these reasons and graphed the number of times each reason occurred, we might get a graph that looks like this. The reason that occurs most often, this highest bar, this is our biggest disruption to flow. Now, because we have limited resources and we can't work on everything, we can't improve everything everywhere, we can use this to focus our continuous improvements. The one and only improvement project I should work on has now been identified. So if you have lean or Six Sigma teams, we now know where to put them to work. It turns out that our, our improvement projects should not come from a brainstorming session, but instead a properly run system that will provide the insight on where to improve to get the biggest bang for your buck. If we eliminate or reduce our biggest disruption to flow, the main reason we were going into the red zone, we are probably not going into the red zone as much, which means our average velocity will be better, and so our velocity has improved even more. And now, with a combination of full kit and focus process improvement, the time through the shop on average is 1.5 weeks. And if the time through the shop is 1.5 weeks, then so is this. This is how we get about a 50% reduction in the time through the shop. We were at six weeks, and now by ignoring efficiency, we're now completing the same amount of work in half the time, just three weeks. We are getting more jobs done faster, and these results occur pretty darn fast, depending on how fast you implement. You can reduce your whip and focus on finishing and you will see an impact in your operation. And that is your homework assignment. So in the handout that you probably downloaded when you registered, that homework assignment was in the handout. The rest of the system takes some experience to figure out and customize for your situation. But here are some things that you'll need to figure out. And sorry for all the words on the screen. You don't need to read them, but I want, wanted you to understand all the things, all the kind of challenges and customization issues that come into dealing with the custom job shop. So believe me, I get it that you're unique and that's the nature of custom job shops. So we need to know how to address all of these challenges, how to size your velocity board for the mix of products you have, how to deal with jobs that take two hours versus jobs that take 2000 hours, how to handle Kanban parts or stock parts because some job shops will have some of those, how to handle a mixture of manufacturing cells along with regular work, how to handle emergency orders and priority orders, what to do if you do repair work in-house and on site, what to do if you pro have prototype work along with regular work, how to size your to-be-release board to ensure every job has full kit before it's turned to be released to the Velocity Board, what to include on your full kit checklist, what should be on your traveler, what goes on the Velocity Board, and other questions specific to your environment and starting conditions. Job shops are unique, they are different. We have to take these things into account. While velocity scheduling system is simple, it can handle a wide variety of cases, and that's because we don't go into the detail planning side. The key is we have to customize it for your environment, for your unique shop. Every shop is different, so customization is extremely important. So let me show you how the implementation framework works. The first thing we do is reduce your work and process. That's your homework assignment. You can do this tomorrow, and you should. This leads to an immediate reduction in the lead time through your shop, and also an immediate improvement to cash flow as jobs spend less time sitting around. Another nice side effect is an immediate reduction in overtime. 
as you start shipping 20 to 50 percent more and doing it with less overtime you'll notice a nice increase in profits the details of how to control your whip to maintain that lower level will depend on your specific situation so again we have to take into account the constraint where is it does it move a lot of shops have moving constraints because of the mix of work changing so how to control this whip is essential and it has to be specific for your shop the next key implementation elements are visual scheduling and visual planning components of the system this is where your velocity board and your to be release board where we get those up they provide the key communication and priority system in your shop, making it clear where to focus and making due date and lead time problems a thing of the past. In a visual system, nothing can hide, nothing can fall through the cracks. We see it all there. It is in this step where a lot of those customization questions will become apparent and you'll need to customize a solution for your situation. Then the third element of your implementation framework is systematizing the Poogie process the process of ongoing improvement. Continuous improvement is not an accident, but a key part of velocity system. You will need to collect and analyze those whys so that your improvement progress does not stagnate. As you eliminate and reduce your biggest disruptions to flow, your chaos will reduce. It is also in this step where you will operationalize the process to determine the release order of your jobs, monitor your load versus capacity, and we will also try to eliminate scheduling surprises and help you plan for capacity expansions. When you have this future planning view of your shop, when your priorities are clear and clearly communicated, chaos substantially reduces. So let's take a look at an example. Tanya inherited the business from her father and despite the downturn in the economy, you can see this is 2009 here, they had tons of work, but they couldn't get it out the door. Their due date performance was less than 40%, 4-0. Customers were threatening to take their business elsewhere. Opportunities were abound, but how do you take on more work when you can't deliver what you've got? The saving grace was their competition wasn't doing much better. Tanya saw a huge opportunity to take market share if she could get on time. If they could do it better than the competition, it would be an understatement to say that her team was skeptical of abandoning efficiency. They were very skeptical, and her dad was still involved, and I think he was the lead skeptic. Uh, Tanya held really firm, though, insisted that they do the program, and she really insisted that they follow it to the letter of the law. And in only a few months, Tanya's team cut through their um, cut the time through their shop in half, increased due date performance to over 97 percent, and started shipping twice as much twice as much. And notice if you double what you're shipping, you have become more efficient. So this is an example of following flow principles and becoming more efficient. Efficiency is not a prerequisite for improvement. It is an effect. So what effects can you expect? You can expect a substantial improvement in due date performance. What substantial depends on your situation. Tanya went from 40% to 97%. I had one client that started at 95% and increased to 99. So they went from 95 to 99 and for them that was substantial. How improvement is delivering, uh, well, so let me ask you a question. How important is delivering on time to your customers and prospects? So when people make their decision to do business with you, what percent of their decision do you think would be based on due date performance? Therefore, how much more business could you get if you improved your due date performance? And take a moment and think about the number of customers who make decisions based on price. How many would pay a little more for a substantial improvement in due date performance? What does it cost your customer to deal with late deliveries? You will also experience a substantial reduction in lead time through your shop. By cutting whip in half, it typically reduces by half. Do customers or prospects ever request a shorter lead time from you? This is an indication that they would benefit from it. Are they ever willing to pay a little more for a shorter lead time? Have they offered to do that? If you could routinely deliver in less time than your competition, could you gain market share? What would that do to your bottom line? And of course, chaos. We've talked about the reduction in chaos. Because the system is visual, there is one priority system and everyone is on the same page, so there's no need to run around firefighting. And as your lead time reduces relative to your quoted lead time, you create a buffer. This buffer allows you to absorb variability and meet those promised due dates. 
if you had a buffer for each due date, how much would you be able to reduce over time? How nice would it be to not have to work every Saturday? How pleasant would it be to work in a shop that was always on time? How nice would it be to take a vacation without the place falling apart? But the biggest result is you've created a competitive advantage. Now you have something to sell. You are better than the competition. You may have uh, heard me talk in the past about mafia offers. It's an offer so good your customers can't refuse it, but it is also one that your competition cannot or will not match. And challenging efficiency is counterintuitive and most competitors will not follow you there. So if you've created an operational competitive advantage like this and then sold that capacity, what would that be worth to you? So here's an example calculation. When you reduce your lead time, the time it takes to get a job through your shops, shop from six weeks to three weeks, you can sell twice as much. So sales double. So we go from one million to two million here. Assuming that you have some way to sell it. One of the issues is sometimes we uncover capacity and they don't have a way to sell it and that's where the mafia offer comes in. But assuming that we uncover the capacity and you have a way to sell it, sales are going to increase. Truly variable costs, TVCs, and theory of constraints, these are the costs that vary by each sale. So for example, raw material, outside services, sales commission, that's what's typical. And we do not allocate direct labor to truly variable costs. Direct labor would be in the operating expense. T is the throughput and results when we subtract the truly variable costs from the sales. Direct labor, all the other wages and fixed costs would be included in operating expense. So in this example, this company went from 300,000 in profit to 1.1 million in profit, that is an $800,000 increase in profits. So the question is, that's great for them, what would it do for your company? When we started today, I asked you to think about what your business would be like if you were getting more done faster. Is this close to what you wrote down? Shorter lead times. What is in it for your company to get more out to your customer faster? What would that do for you? 99 plus percent due date performance. What would happen if you could consistently meet customer expectation for delivery? Can you even imagine what that would be like? How much less Pepto-Bismol would you go through? Increased sales. How much more could you sell if you had a total handle on scheduling and a clear priority system that would allow everyone on your team to align to the same consistent goal, getting more quality work done faster? And what would that clear priority system do for your shop communications? Reduced overtime. How much money do you pay out every month in overtime that comes as a result of your current scheduling system? What else could you do with that money? More free time. Okay, so this is now where it becomes interesting. If you, hadn't, if you didn't have to bog your employees down with efficiency and they were focused on velocity, they would actually have more free time. So how would you use that time? Now let's talk about people for a moment. What would your life be like if you were surrounded by happy employees and ecstatic customers? What would your stress levels be if you weren't constantly at the mercy of risk taking, chaos and stress? What would your bottom line do if you and everyone on your team could simply answer the question, why should I buy from you? This may not be exactly what you wrote down, but you need to be clear on the outcome you want. I can tell you one thing for sure. If you are not clear on what you want, it will never happen. If you don't take action, you will not get the results. But if some version of this is what you want for you and your employees, then how can we make it happen? If you're asking these questions, then I'm really excited for you. What that means is that you're, you're already thinking through the process and you're way ahead of, of your competitors. The key is customizing it. The size of the board, what's included in your full kit checklist versus what's on your traveler, how to deal with your unique situations, figuring all that out is critical to your success. So your remaining question would be, uh, will, but will it work for me? You know, we're different, we're unique, we have a lot of those challenges. Will it work for me? How do I customize it for me? And those are great, great questions. And there's way too many people on this call to go one by one and determine if each of you, uh, if your companies are a good fit. But what we can do is 
I'd be happy to talk to you one on one offline so that we don't bore everyone else with your specifics and so that you can be as candid as needed. So I'd be happy to talk one on one to determine if and how this approach might work for you. We need to dig in and understand your current situation and constraints. So if you'd like to have a chat, you can go to VelociScheduling.com forward slash private. You'll need to enter your name and phone number so that uh, we can call you to schedule a time to talk. There's no charge for this. We're just going to see if you're a good fit. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. I need to unmute his line here. And Mike, have any questions come in? I'm happy to answer some questions if we've got a few questions in there. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. And also, you may want to tell these guys about some of the scholarship opportunities that might be available. Muted. Hello? Unmuted. Hello? Mike? Yep. You're, you're live. You're on. Okay. Um, the the uh, concept that Lisa just, just was talking about of uh, having a private one-on-one -on -one call is really kind of part of our embed philosophy in that we want to des design a custom uh, solution for you and make sure that, that what we're advocating here is a good fit for you personally because everybody's different. Um, so I encourage everyone, uh, if this uh, presentation has intrigued you, to uh, click on the website and schedule a one-on-one uh, -on -one call with Lisa, and she'll help you to uh, calculate kind of what the uh, return on investment might be for this type of a program. Uh, we do uh, offer a, we, we tried to design somewhat of a mafia offer ourselves trying to practice what we preach. So we want people to sign up and so to do that we've, we've offered a, a $2,000 scholarship for companies once they uh, have had the one-on-one -on -one call and are interested in moving forward and, and request a, a proposal from CIRF. If you get that proposal and you send it back to us within uh, two, two days, we're going to give you a discount uh, because we really want to work with you. All right. And the only question I have is one that I typed in, Lisa, and that's it. Uh, here in Iowa, we've had uh, as I look through the uh, attendee list, we have we have uh, equipment manufacturers, we have some printers, we have uh, some ag-related industries, and a lot of that is really slowed down here in our state. And we are experiencing com most companies have excess capacity in their plant and their, their constraint is really in their market. Okay, so let me talk about a market constraint and how this uh, kind of fits with it. And then uh, I also see a question here from Chad, so I'll get to Chad's question as well. So if you have a market constraint, a market constraint means that you have more capacity than you have sales, right? So you need to sell more. To create a compelling reason for the market to choose you over somebody else is the key. That's what I call the mafia offer. What we do in Velocity Scheduling is we create a competitive advantage. We get the speed through your shop increased so much. We get you 100% on time that now we can take those competitive advantages. You made changes. You went out and made physical changes of how you run your business. And then the Mafia offer is based on that. If you make an offer to the market that's not based on changes you made, it's really easy for the competition to follow. follow. That's why price is never a Mafia offer. Your competition can match the price if they want to and they can do it very quickly. So the key is improving your operations. So now you have something to base a market offer on and to really stand out from uh, to your competition, that you are completely different. So imagine if you, I've got some examples of mafia offers on the website, but imagine that uh, you could do the work in a fraction of the time of everybody else, or maybe it's even just slightly faster, but you could guarantee it you guaranteed to deliver on that day. That's some of the things you can start to be able to do when you have your operations in control. If you try to go out and create a mafia offer, unless you have a lot of excess capacity, without first getting your operations under control, uh, it can get you into trouble. Because the worst thing to do is create an offer and then not be able to deliver it. That's 
uh, going to have the wrong effect. So, Mike, did that answer your question about market constraints? Definitely. Okay. So, Chad has a question here about how does VSS handle capacity overruns when you get a surge of sales? And doesn't that always happen? It seems like it's feast or famine. Um, the short answer, the quick answer, Chad, is that there's a natural load leveling that occurs. So if you reduce and control your whip, there's going to be this natural load leveling that occurs. Now, the other thing is that you may have oversold your capacity. So if you've promised more than what you can deliver in that time period, you also need to know that. And that's something that we look at in what I call the detail planning side. It's not detailed in that we're not scheduling every job on every machine, but it's when we're looking at load versus capacity. So there's two ways that we address it. One is there's a natural load leveling that occurs, and the second is that we need to know if we've overcommitted. So if we do the load leveling and we're going to be late on some of it, that's something that we need to know. And that's part of what, uh, what you need to be aware of in your load versus capacity situation. The, did that answer your question, Chad, or any follow-up to that? And anybody else have any questions, feel free to type them in. Okay, um, I've got a question from uh, Ross here about how much will your service cost for a typical 20 employee shop? Do you provide a firm estimate of the cost after the initial meeting? Um, yeah, the, the cost ranges uh, based on what scholarships and things that Mike has for you, what might be there. So it's what I'll say at this point is it's extremely affordable. Most people pay it back during the 14 weeks so the program the, that we talk about now, I'll tell you all about it in the private session, assuming that you are a good fit for it, it's a 14-week coaching program. It's not training. So I don't, I don't believe in training because I don't think it gets enough results. Training is good, but we need action with it. So with the coaching program, it's a go-and-do program. So I give you step-by-step -step what to do. You actually go do it, then you have questions, and we go through in that manner. So it takes about 14 weeks to go through it. Most of the time, uh, you said you have 20 employees, you should be able to pay it back within your 14 weeks or be very close to that. And that's part of the analysis we'll do in the private call. I'll find out about um, what your sales are and your employees. And most importantly, what I have to determine is how much speed I think we can gain, how much productivity I think we can gain in your case. So that private session is very in-depth. And I'm going to give you an estimate of how much improvement you're going to get so that we're very clear on that. Because if it, if you're not a good fit for whatever reason, or if it's not financially worth it, I'm going to tell you that. We're going to do that as part of that calculation. Next, I have a question here from George. Are there examples where multiple job shops work with competing consolidators? Multiple job shops work with competing consolidators. I'm not sure I understand that question. Mike, do you understand the question? Uh, the, the only thing I can think of is the consolidators would be like an OEM where you have multiple job shops that are providing the same company. And are you talking about an example from the VSS side or the Mafia offer side, George? Well, while we're waiting for George to give us a little more detail, I've got a question here, another from Chad. Uh, follow up on capacity overruns. Is the concept that you have a tighter handle on capacity so upper management can choose to elongate lead time or increase capacity. Uh, do you have a tighter handle on your capacity? I would say yes. You have a. What happens is when you control your work and process, you eliminate a lot of sources of variability. And so it becomes very predictable. You can look at your entire backlog and you can predict when every job will go on the velocity board. So in other words, when it will be started and when it will be finished. And of course, you can compare that to the due date. If you could do that for your entire backlog, I would, I could probably categorize that as having a tighter handle on your capacity. So yes, I would guess that's, um, you would see that, and then it's a business decision whether or not you want to increase capacity or increase your lead time. So good question, Chad. Um, okay, George's follow-up is like shipbuilders. Yes, BSS, like shipbuilders. So like a shipbuilder hires a lot of different people that are supplying things or aircraft manufacturers, Boeing, Airbus, are consolidators and use same or similar job shops for components. So do you, let me look at the first question. Are there examples where multiple job shops work with competing consolidators? 
So do job shop. So would one job shop supply both Boeing and Airbus, for example? That's the question. Yes. Okay. Um, I I think that it happens at least some of the time. I'm not sure how much Boeing and Airbus require that you not work with one of their competitors. I've never really asked the job shops that I work with whether they they uh, supply to competitors. But in any case, VSS is going to work for those the people supplying the components. Those are my biggest customers are the people that supply components to OEMs because they tend to be job shops. They're not making gazillions of the same thing. You know, they're they're making a custom product. Maybe some of it repeats, some of it doesn't. Um, and yes, VSS is going to work for those component, if you will, job shop component manufacturers. Any other? I, I, Go ahead. I, I just I, I just might add that uh, you know Cirrus has has done a review of our projects and and we found that the uh, number one factor in success is management support and direction. So several of you are uh, not top management people, and so you know this is a, a pretty major change that we need to get them on board with if you want to have a success. So. Um, and I think Lisa will talk about this. This uh, seminar will be on replay, and we, we gladly uh, would provide you the link to that. And we certainly recommend that you let top management view this, uh, because if they're not on board, this this can bring on some changes that uh, they're probably going to uh, disagree with if they're operating in the efficiency world. And secondly. Um, because we're here local here in Iowa, if, if you guys would like some uh, companies that you could go visit with and talk to about this that have implemented this system, you know, feel free to contact me and, and I can set those up. Yeah, and those companies, uh, we sign confidentiality agreements so that I don't talk about those companies and of course they don't share the details of how velocity scheduling works. So what they can do is they can tell you about their experience of working with me. They can tell you about their results. They, they cannot uh, share with you the specifics of, here, this is Velocity Scheduling System. They, they can't tell you about the board or how it works. And it really wouldn't help that much anyway because the customization is so key. So And just because somebody else got results doesn't mean you'll get results. I find that the biggest components to success are your commitment to say, yes, we want to give this a try and then you taking action quickly. When you do those two things, then um, you know results are going to come. So I think that that's where I would say that you really need to decide. First, we need to see if you're a good fit. Assuming you're a good fit, then this shouldn't be one of many things you're doing. You know, It should be kind of the key project because it is all encompassing. When we're talking about your scheduling at a full kit, you know, full kit is your raw materials or purchasing, um, engineering or design, if you have that, it's pretty comprehensive. It's going to affect your entire company, as you would expect. Something that can improve your profitability typically is going to have a big effect. Um, and then George said, yes, leadership commitment. Do or not, or not do, there is no try. Yes, exactly what Yoda said. Do or not do, there is no try. So one of the things I, if you're a good fit in that uh, when we have our private discussion, one of the things I'll tell you that you need to do is get your team together. And the question for your team is, are we willing to give this a try, yes or no? Any answer other than yes is a no. So you really have to be committed, otherwise you're wasting my time and your time. And like the, the program is not very expensive, so it's really a time, the time commitment is the key thing. Can you talk about that time commitment, Lisa? Yeah, so what it takes, uh, the first thing you do is you get your Velocity team together. So these are the people who are going to work with me. We work remotely. We use GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar, so this, this platform. So we have a visual component as well as audio. You would be obviously unmuted in that scenario. And you, your team, I give your, your team step-by-step -step what to do. And then every Monday at 9.30 Mountain Time, we are going to talk. So the commitment is your team is going to watch one video per week for the first 10 weeks 
the video is about an hour. Let's say after you watch the video, in the video I gave you an assignment, go do this, because this is a go and do program. Um, let's say you spend an hour discussing the homework I just gave you. And then what I want you to do prior to our coaching session, because the coaching is the most important piece, I want you to prepare for coaching. Preparing for coaching means you're going to uh, prepare any questions you have. And the thing I always want to know is what, what you did. This tells me how you interpreted the homework assignment and what effects you're seeing. So if every week you tell me what you did and what effects you're seeing, I'll know if we're headed in the right a direction and if we're headed to the results that we calculated you should be getting at the beginning. Um, and then the, the the coaching session is about an hour. So preparing for coaching is an hour and then the coaching session itself is about an hour. So that's four hours per week for the members of your Velocity team. So it's not um, insignificant. It's a pretty big commitment and it's impossible, impossible to get buy-in ahead of time. You can't there's no way your team is all going to agree that this is the greatest thing ever ahead of time. So what I say is don't worry about getting buy-in. The key thing is about getting agreement to their willingness to give it a try. So you ask them, are we willing to give it a try? Yes or no. Any answer other than yes is a no and you should not sign up. But if the answer is, yeah, we, you know, we're willing to give that a try and assuming that you're a good fit, then, then proceeding would be uh, a great idea. Okay. Do you, have any more, do you have any more questions, Lisa? I don't see any other questions come in. Okay. So I think we can probably sign off. We're right at 10.03. We've had a couple people drop off anyway. Oh, here's one question from Chad. Uh, thanks. Will there be a recording? Um, this sounds exactly like the direction I've been hoping to go, and having a more formal system and expertise seems to be helpful. Okay, so Chad had a question about recording. Yes, um, what we're going to do is, assuming that the recording took, we're on the same place where you registered for this. I'll replace that with the replay. Give us a couple days. You should get an email from the system once it's done. So you'll get an email from the GoToWebinar saying that the replay is ready. So just give it a couple days, and um, I think we can have it up probably tomorrow, assuming every, the technology all works out. So just look for an email, Chad, and we'll let you know when it's available. As far as scheduling your uh, private session, you can do that at any time. One of the things I will recommend that, that you get all your key people involved in that private session because that's where I'm going to take all the concepts and ask you questions and really go deep. So you're going to want your key people involved in that. And prior to that, you want everybody to have watched a replay everybody who's going to be in the private session. I don't want to spend a lot of time in the private session explaining what's explained in the webinar. Instead, I'd like to spend the time talking about your unique situation. All right, Mike, I think that's it. I think we've exhausted the questions. So thank you for hosting. And thanks, everybody, for showing up and spending this time to work on your company. It's a very uh, rare opportunity that we get to work on our company instead of in our company. So uh, congratulate yourselves for doing that. And anything else you'd like to add, Mike? Uh, thank you for uh, coming online today and doing this. And uh, I just hope I would encourage companies to make that call um, and discuss the details. Uh, Sirius would love to provide you a proposal. And of course, we always offer the follow-up uh, that goes along with that to help you uh, implement everything. So um, I encourage you to do that and good luck. Great. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.